Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Let's all stand together and sing. <clears throat> Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. For He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture, and the sheep of His hand, and the sheep of His hand. Joyful, joyful, we adore Thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before the opening to the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt away. Giver of immortal gladness, fill us with the light of day. All thy works with joy around thee, earth and heaven reflect thy rays. Stars and angels sing around thee, center of unbroken praise. Field and forest, vale and mountain, flowery meadow, flashing sea, chanting bird and flowing fountain, Call us to rejoice in Thee. Mortals, join the mighty chorus which the morning stars began. Father, love is reigning o'er us. Brother, love finds man to man. Ever singing, march we onward, victors in the midst of strife. Joyful music leads us onward in the triumph song of life. Please be seated. Good morning. Good to see y'all. We have a few announcements that some of them was on the uh, screen. Just remember Jason Leje. He's had major surgery Monday, neck surgery, and our sympathy goes out for Sylvia McClue. Y'all remember Bubba and Sylvia came to sit over there. He's a retired banker from Hanville. He passed away. Let's remember her. And also Kyle Young, Chris James's brother, uh, had a severe arm cut. There's many people with COVID. I have a sister-in-law's nephew who has COVID. And uh, there's still a lot of ill people out there. And, uh, and our nation's ill. It's hurting. So let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer at this time. Father in heaven, we approach thy throne of grace this morning with thankful hearts and heavy hearts for those that we mourn for, like Sylvia and the son and the, and the granddaughters and the passing the bubble. And Father, we want you to touch Jason's, Leger's body to heal his neck injury, his neck surgery. Be with Kyle Young. <clears throat> Be with my sister-in-law's nephew who has COVID. And Father, we pause at this time to ask you to put your hand of healing upon our nation. A lot of chaos. A lot of unnecessary killings. People be, hate more than they love. Father, we ask you to instill that love back into our nation, to the leaders. Bind us back together, as the song says, and may, us, may we have love. Father, we look forward to worshiping you today. Worship you in spirit and truth, from songs to the lesson to observance of the Lord's Supper. 
We thank you for this opportunity and for the place we can worship. Thank you for all of our members. Father, I want you to guide and direct us all the days of our life. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for mercy, and we thank you for grace. In your son's name we pray, Christ. Amen. Good morning. Would you join me in my reading of the scripture? It's 2 Timothy, the third chapter, verses 16 and 17. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instructions in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped with every good work. God bless the reading of the scripture. I love to tell the story of fancy things above, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story because I know it is true. It satisfies my longings as nothing else can do. I love to tell the story, twill be a theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story, tis pleasant to repeat. What seems each time I tell it, more wonderfully sweet. I love to tell the story, for some have never heard the of salvation from God's own holy word. I love to tell the story, twill be a theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story for those who know it best. Seem hungering and thirsting to bear it like the rest. And when in scenes of glory I sing the new, new song, will be that I have loved so long. I love to tell the story, twill be a theme in glory, to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see, wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty, teach me faith and duty. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words. Wonderful words of life. Sweetly echoes the gospel call. Wonderful words of life. Offer pardon and peace to all. Wonderful words of life. Jesus, only Savior, sanctify forever. Beautiful 
words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Grace and peace to everybody this morning. So glad you've come to be with us and glad for all of those who've tuned us in online as well. We hope everybody will join us online at 5 o'clock, as always on Sunday nights, for our lesson tonight, The Blessing of Confessing. There was a little girl who noticed the preacher doing something kind of odd to her every Sunday just before the sermon. Just before he would get up to take the pulpit, he'd bow his head, he'd silently mouth his lips, and then he would go up and take the pulpit and start preaching. After she observed him doing that several Sundays in a row after church one Sunday, she went up and asked him, Preacher, why every Sunday before you preach, you bow your head and move your lips, and, and then you go up and preach? He said, Well, sweetheart, I'm just saying a little prayer and asking God to give me a good sermon. She said, Well, why don't he ever do it? I suspect that from time to time, some folks stand in the back of the auditorium after church, and they might ask, How do you like the sermon today? Our families around the lunch table will say, what would you think of the preacher's sermon today? God's people need to know how to recognize a good sermon when they've heard it. And so let's make a list of about seven criteria for a good sermon. With the idea that if it meets all of these, we should conclude, no matter what else we think about it, it is a good sermon because it meets the criteria for such. And we'll be reading from 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. 2 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 5. Paul knows he's about to be executed, and younger preachers like Timothy are going to have to carry on his mantle. And so he writes to Timothy, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, here's what I charge you to do. Preach the Word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, Timothy... Always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, and fulfill your ministry. Number one, first and foremost, it is a good sermon if it is true to God's Word. Here in our lesson text in verse 2, Paul says, I charge you to preach the Word. Give them the Word. Give them teaching of the Word of God. In 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 21, we read that there were men throughout time who when they spoke and when they wrote the pages of the Bible, they spoke and they wrote as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Moved in that verse is Pharaoh in the Greek, and it means to carry or to bear. When people wrote the pages of the Bible, about 40 different writers, the 66 books of the Bible, the message that they wrote did not originate with them. The message came and they, it was delivered to them from heaven and they wrote it down as they were moved or carried along or borne along by the Holy Spirit to write that message. The message didn't come from the writers of the Bible. It came from the Spirit of God who guided them in the writing of it. So that the pages of the Bible are the inspired Word of God. The God-breathed, inspired Scriptures. What that means is we know that the Holy Spirit guided the, the Old Testament writers to write in Hebrew. And the Holy Spirit of God guided the New Testament writers to write in Greek. We have discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls, which gave us the oldest Hebrew manuscripts of the Old Testament that we have in our possession today. And we have discovered, archaeologists have, almost 6,000 manuscripts or manuscript fragments of the 27 books of the New Testament in the Greek manuscripts. 
And whenever a teacher of God's Word or a preacher of the Gospel labors to share the fruit of his labors with us, to help us understand the Hebrew and the Greek, we should appreciate that because he's helping us understand not some translation in some language, but he's helping us to understand the Hebrew and the Greek because the Hebrew and the Greek is the inspired Word of God. And preachers, when they preach, are to preach the Word that Paul says. A sermon cannot be fairly judged on the basis of human opinion only. We could never be united on whether or not any sermon was a good sermon if all we're depending upon is human feelings. Somebody said, a funny thing happened on the way to unity. Opinion got in the way. Opinions are like noses. Everybody's got one and everybody's is different. And everybody has an opinion and is entitled to an opinion. But when it comes to judging a sermon fairly, the first and foremost criteria is, is it true to God's Word? It may not have hit me personally. It may not have been to my personal liking, my favorite sermon. But if it's true to God's Word, then it is a good sermon sermon. Number two, it's a good sermon, not only when it is true to God's Word, but when it's preached in love. Notice in our lesson text in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 2 that it is to be preached. The Word is to be preached with exhortation and with long suffering or complete patience. The word exhort there is parkaleo. It means encouragement. People need to be encouraged. They need preaching from preachers who are patient and long-suffering. In other words, they need to preach the truth, but they need to do it in love. Ephesians 4, verse 15, if the church is going to grow into the image of Christ, it needs preaching that is the truth in love. Yes, it does need to be the truth. It does need to be sometimes rebuking and reproving. 2 Timothy 4.2 And when I'm rebuked, it doesn't feel very good. When I'm reproved, it's not to my personal liking. But if I need my toes to be stepped on, then that is the loving thing for you to do for me. To tell me the truth. The most unloving thing you could ever do to me is to fail to tell me what I need to know. If I've got part of my breakfast on my face, and everybody just lets me walk around with it on my face and nobody tells me the truth, that's not very kind. If you'll tell me the truth, I may go look in the mirror and be so embarrassed, but I will be glad that you embarrassed me. I'm glad that you told me what I needed to know. The most loving thing perhaps that you can ever do for me is to tell me what I need to know even if initially it hurts me. Tell me the truth. Exhort me and reprove me when I need it. Just make sure you balance it with encouragement and patience and love. Speak the truth in love. Balance it with love. In James chapter 3, James distinguishes a stark contrast between two different types of wisdom. Earthly wisdom, which is not true wisdom at all, and heavenly wisdom. So when you're listening to a sermon or teaching in a Bible class, how do you know if the wisdom that's being imparted to you is earthly or heavenly? Well, in James 3, verses 14 to 16, James says that if it's earthly wisdom, it comes from a place of bitter jealousy and selfish ambition, and it results in disorder and strife. But if the wisdom of a message from the pulpit is Godly wisdom, if it's heavenly wisdom, if it's coming down from above, then it will be characterized as pure and peaceable and gentle and open to reason. Wisdom that is from above is full of mercy and good fruits. It is impartial and sincere. James 3.17 We ought to be able to recognize the difference between earthly wisdom and heavenly wisdom within a message from the pulpit. And that which is a good sermon is that which is heavenly wisdom being imparted. That which is true to God's Word and it's 
preached from a place of love and in a loving manner that produces peace and gentleness and unity. Number three, it's a good sermon when it's preached to meet needs. And as you look around at our congregation this morning, you'll notice a lot of diversity. And that is a good thing in a congregation. But I suppose that the thing that diversifies us the most is our wide age range. We've got folks here that are badly toddlers, and we've got folks here who are, let's just say, way on up there. And we've got folks all places in between. And it is a challenge to try to meet the needs of all of those different age groups. The world is a much different place than it was just 20 years ago. And it's really different than it was 30 or 40 years ago. And People are different today. Times are different. Kids are different. And methods for meeting needs are different. Because people have different needs and different interests, different ways that they respond more easily to. People learn in different ways. And it's a challenge not to change the Gospel but to change the methodology for how to appeal to the needs of as many different age groups as possible. Did you know that there are seven different generations represented in the pews right now? We have the silent generation. We have a lot of baby boomers here. We have Gen X's. We have Xennials. We have the Millennials. We have Generation Z and Gen Alphas. Seven different distinct generations sitting right here, right now, at one moment in time and in one place. And all seven of those generations see the world a little bit differently from the others. There is a generation gap between all seven of those generations. And it is impossible to turn worship, if it's true worship, into a carnival or a roller coaster ride. It is impossible to adequately meet the needs of that many generations in one sermon. The best that a preacher can do is try to appeal at some point in the sermon to as many different age groups as possible. And if you see a preacher over a series of sermons having made an attempt to reach all generations on their level, that's a good thing. That should be recognized and appreciated when it's preached to meet a need. Worship cannot be entertainment, but preachers should try to appeal to as many different kinds of people as possible. It's a good sermon, number four, when it's spoken so that all can understand. And that's another big challenge also. Because you got folks with different educational levels, different age levels, different levels of intelligence. And you can't just preach baby food all the time for those who are more skilled in God's Word will starve if they don't get the meat of God's Word. But if you're always preaching the meat of God's Word, the babies and the younger ones in the faith will starve because they can't eat steak yet. They need the milk of God's Word. So it's a challenge to try to meet all of those different skill levels, intelligence levels, and all those different levels of understanding. But it should be appreciated that over a course of a month of sermons, for example, that there's an effort made to reach all levels of understanding. No matter how good a sermon is, if it's not understandable, it doesn't accomplish a whole lot. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, Paul was dealing with a unique situation in the church of Corinth. Back in the first century, if an apostle laid hands on a Christian, that Christian could receive the supernatural ability of speaking in tongues. Now the word for tongue in the Greek is glossa, and glossa does not mean some unknown tongue. Glossa means a known human language. And at the church at Corinth, people in the church were using the gift of languages irresponsibly. A bunch of people all at once, right in the middle of the worship assembly, all started preaching at the same time in a bunch of different languages simultaneously. Can you imagine what that would sound like? If men and women in every section of the room 
started preaching in, in all sorts of different languages, why it would be a madhouse. And nobody would be understanding anything. So Paul writes to them and says, just let one person talk at a time and make sure they've got a translator. If they don't have anybody to translate what they're saying, tell them to hush. Because no matter how it may be moved by the Spirit, no matter how heaven-sent the message may be, if it's not understandable, it's not worth anything. And it just causes disorderliness and confusion. So yes, we should pray and sing and preach with the Spirit, the message from the Spirit of God. But it should also be with understanding. So people can understand it. How else, Paul asked in verse 16, can anybody say amen to it? If a person can't understand what's being said, how can anybody say amen to it? Now, we don't have these gift of tongues in the church today, but we do need to follow this principle of speaking so as to be understood so the church can say amen. Now, what that tells me is a couple of things. Number one, the church needs to be saying amen. Hello? Hello? Thank, thank you. Let me say that again. The church needs to be saying amen. And even if you don't say it out loud, you need to be saying it in your mind and in your heart. And how can you amen a message if you don't understand it? It's a good effort when the preacher tries to make it understandable to as many people as possible. I encourage all of you men, when you get up to lead worship, to speak so that you can be heard and understood. I encourage these young men who are in training to be leaders, not to be afraid of the microphone. The fellows in the back need to have the microphone on and turned up. And you young fellows, you need to be able to hear your voice coming through the speaker. If you can't hear your voice being amplified through the speakers, I promise you there are people sitting here who can't hear what you're saying. Hey, Miss Lawana. See, she didn't hear that. I'm getting more and more like her. It's, it's getting hard for me to hear. I'm getting like my grandma Grace, who, bless her heart, lived to be 102, and she'd call me every week and she wanted to discuss the Bible and and everything I'd say in the middle of it, she'd say, Hey, I'd say, Ma, turn up your hearing aid. Hey, turn up your phone, Ma. We gave her a special phone. You could adjust the volume. Seriously, though, if you're not being heard, then people can't understand it. And they can't say amen to it. So make sure you're heard and understood. And appreciate preachers and teachers who... Try to teach on a level that's understandable. Number five, it's a good sermon when it glorifies God. And isn't that our primary purpose? To please Him rather than ourselves. To please God rather than the audience. Whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10.31 To God be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations. Ephesians 3, 21. Make sure it's a sermon that's, that honors God. and That makes it a good sermon. Number six, it's a good sermon when it challenges people to think. And I've lived long enough to learn that most people would rather do anything than think. People would rather die than think. And it's human nature to resist change. But how can you grow if you're not thinking? And how can you grow if you're not changing? Some years ago, in another congregation where I was laboring, we had a lot of 7th and 8th graders. And they all went to the same elementary school. And the yearbook came out about this time toward the end of the school year. And as I looked at the picture of those 7th and 8th graders, it was so funny they all look like babies in those pictures. Because obviously, the school pictures were taken early in the school year, nine months earlier. And by the time they came out in the yearbook, at the end of the school year, nine months later, they had changed so much 
that in their pictures from nine months ago, they look like babies. But that's a good thing. You know if they're changing, they're growing. That's how you know somebody's changing for the better or how they're growing for the better is if they're changing for the better. Sometimes church folk get a little too self-satisfied and set in their ways. And they need their feathers ruffled from the pulpit. You know what a rut is? A rut is a coffin with both ends kicked out. If you let yourself get in a rut, you've got one foot in the grave. You're half spiritually dead if you're in a rut. It's a preacher's job to not let you get in a rut. And it should be appreciated when sermons are preached to challenge us not to be ugly or unkind, but to challenge us to be all that we can be. To be all that God expects us to be. Remember Jesus' Sermon on the Mount? Matthew chapters 5 through 7, and some of it is in Luke as well. How did Jesus approach that sermon? And shouldn't preachers preach like Jesus? This sermon was assembled beginning with the Beatitudes. It's about attitudes. And Jesus didn't come to help people feel more complacent in their attitude. He came to change their attitudes. Jesus preached to change the way people think. At least five different times in chapter 5, He says, You have heard that it has been said to those of old, such and such, but I say to you this and this. You've been taught this, but I'm teaching you something else. You've heard it said that that is true, but I say that this is true. Jesus is challenging the way they think. Finally, number seven, it's a good sermon if it's preached from conviction. You know, if the preacher acts like he really believes it, maybe the audience will too. If the preacher's got a little fire in his bones, maybe he can light a fire under the church. Sermons ought to be preached with passion. And that passion should not be mistook for being angry or upset or judging the audience. But it's just that the preacher is so passionate about what he's saying and he cares so much. That's what makes him passionate. He cares about the message and he cares about the audience so much that it makes him passionate. And he preaches with conviction. And that's a good thing. One preacher preached one long sermon one Sunday without any fire or conviction or passion. He put the church to sleep, nearly put himself to sleep. And finally, after that long sermon and service, there was one regular church lady in the audience and she recognized a visitor. And This church lady went to the visitor and said, Hello, I'm Gladys Dunn. And the visitor said, I'm glad he's done too. I, I, I can't make it a theme park experience when I stand up and preach. But I can preach with passion and conviction in the hopes that you'd catch a little bit of that fire and say, you know what? That's one of the criteria that makes it a good sermon is that it's preached with passion and conviction. If it meets all of these criteria, if it's preached with conviction, if it challenges us, if it glorifies God, if it's understandable, if it meets needs, maybe not that sermon, my need, but over time the sermons do meet my need as well as other people's needs from time to time. If it's preached from a place of love, and if it's biblical, if it's true to Scripture, Doesn't that mean it's a good sermon? Even if we didn't particularly like it. If God says it's a good sermon, isn't that what's most important? That we judge sermons not by human approval and pleasure of people, but by the standard of what did God think about that sermon. In Galatians 1 and verse 10, Paul asks some questions. Am I seeking the approval of man? Or of God? Am I trying to please man? 
If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Sermons are not intended to be liked. Listen to me carefully. Sermons are not intended to be liked. They're intended to be lived. And no matter how good a sermon is, even how good God says it is, it doesn't accomplish a whole lot unless people respond to it. A sermon is only as meaningful as people are willing to respond to it with holy living, godly action, and true Christian dedication. The best sermon that will be preached here today is not mine. The best sermon that will be preached here today is the one you preach by your response to it. The sermon that you preach by the example that you set for your family and your friends who are sitting here witnessing it. The sermon you preach by your example when you step out into one of these aisles You come on down front. You repent of the sin in your life. Confess your faith in Christ. And join Him in baptism for the remission of your sins. That will be the best sermon that will be preached here today when you make that response. If you've already done that in the past, but you have strayed away from faithful service to the Lord, The best sermon that will be preached here today is the one you preach with your example of coming forward and acknowledging your waywardness and recommitting your life to the Lord as a Christian. That will be the best sermon preached here today. How good was a sermon? How did you like the sermon? How did God like the sermon? Make it as meaningful as it can be by responding to it. The guys in the back are putting up our song. PJ's coming up to lead it. As we stand and sing, we invite you to come. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His gracious Are you
Miss Sandra Jones comes forward and says, I need help. She's struggling with a lot in her life and her family. You know she's missing Jim. And she feels like she's kind of going alone now. She's trying to be the best example that she can be uh, as a mom and a grandmom to her family. And she sometimes feels like, where did I go wrong? What mistakes did I make? But you know other people, even your own family, no matter how much you try to influence them, they make their own choices and decisions. And you've got a good family. You've got good people that love you and pull for you. And you've got a good church family. And all we can do is do the best we can to be the best example that we can be to other people. But Miss Sandra needs strength to be what she wants to be. So let's pray together for her. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would hear Miss Sandra's cry unto you. We invoke your presence in our midst and we offer our pleas unto you on her behalf. Forgive her, Father, for anything she might have done wrong. Father, bless her in her quest to be the best example that she can be. Help her to find the strength that she needs. Father, help us to realize that your own son, the only perfect man that ever lived, was rejected by so many that the majority failed to accept his message. How can we do any better? Father, help us to be content to follow Jesus to say what needs to be said, to do what needs to be done, and to entrust the rest into your hands. Help us, Father, to let go and let God. To let go and, and turn things over to you, Father, to do what you can do. Help us participate in the process and be instruments through whom you can work and operate to influence others. Father, help us all to have a tender heart like Miss Sandra. Give us the strength and the encouragement we need to live for you each day. Father, we love Sandra. We love all her family and friends and neighbors. And we pray, Father, that you'd bless her for all the good that she has done in your kingdom over the decades. In Jesus' name, we pray and we praise you, Lord. Amen. Is there any, anyone here this morning that did not receive a communion cup and needs one before he partake of the Lord's Supper this morning? If not, to help prepare our hearts and our minds for the Lord's Supper this morning, we're going to sing, Tell Me the Story of Jesus. Tell me the story of Jesus, write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Tell how the angels in chorus sang as they welcomed his birth. Glory to God in the highest, peace and good tidings on earth. Tell me the story of Jesus. Write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, 
sweetest that ever was heard. Fasting alone in the desert, tell of the days that are past, how for our sins he was tempted, yet was triumphant at last. Tell of the years of his labor, tell of the sorrow he bore. He was despised and afflicted, homeless, rejected, Tell me the story of Jesus. Write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Tell of the where they nailed him, writhing in anguish and pain. Tell of the grave where they laid him. Tell how he liveth again. Love in that story so tender, clearer than ever I see. Say, let me weep while you whisper. Love paid the ransom for me. Tell me the story of Jesus. Write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was Let's pray together before we commune. Our Heavenly Father, we are so thankful. Our Father, so thankful for that ultimate show of love that Jesus died for each of us. He died so that we can be with you, to, with, with you one day. Our Father, we come together now to take this bread that represents his blood. We ask that we'll have right, the right minds and the right hearts as we take this together. In Christ's name, amen. Let's go to in prayer again. Our Father, we continue to focus on the sacrifice that was made for us, to continue on Jesus hanging on the cross for the suffering that he went through for us, for the blood that flowed down his body. We ask that you be with us as we take this cup. In Christ's name, amen. We also have the opportunity on the first day of the week to give back, and if you would like to, there's a box in the back um, for contributions. 
um, for those online, there's also the opportunity online to give. So uh, let's go together and pray for the work here. Our Heavenly Father, we are, we are so grateful for everything you've given us. We're so grateful for this congregation and the work that's done from here. We're so grateful for the hearts and the, the dedication to serving you and to serving this community. Our Father, we ask that you bless the gifts that are given and that everything that's given be used to your glory. In Christ's name, amen. You may go first or you want to. I will. I'll get them all excited and then finish them off. I have a card here from the Holton family thanking everybody for the gifts and all for their their new daughter into the world. And uh, we thank you for supporting them. And we'll post this card upon the, the board. What was our number today? 115. What's our goal for... Phil Sunday and next month? 120. 120. All right. So every Phil Sunday, we were looking to have it to be a big day. Uh, and I don't want to show of hands, but think about how many of you invited somebody to church today. I said I didn't want to see a show of hands, but thank you anyway. So think about it. We just need five more people to meet our goal. But how, how easy is that? Plan on being here and inviting people. To, we could easily fill this place up. We've got a crowd of people here today, and it's, it's encouraging. But let's make the fill Sunday. Let's start on it. Let's work on it right now. We should work on it every Sunday, but let's really make this fill Sunday a big deal. All right. Right after I get through making announcements, as you can hear the noise starting to jingle in the background, all these young last leaders are going to be coming up here and sharing with you the things that they have won, and Mike's going to tell you all about that. And right after that, we're going to have a Lads Leaders Luncheon and a brief meeting for critique and, and general plans for the coming year. But if you misunderstood me last Sunday and you brought food and you want to come join and eat with us too, that's perfectly all right. If you didn't bring food, McDonald's... I'm, I'm sorry, I was just kidding. Uh... <clears throat> Right after that lunch is over with, I want to remind you that we will start, we've already got some of the stuff out there, but it's, 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 not, a, it's not a whole lot of stuff, but we're going to start unveiling some of the extra stuff that we've found in our reorganizing, and, and if, if there's an item out there on the table that you think might be somebody's keepsake or whatever, give them a shot at least till Wednesday, you know, come Wednesday to, to get that, but they'll be available to be looked at or whatever right after we get through with dinner today through next Sunday. I also got the card out in front of the horse a little bit last week when I made the, uh, some announcements in Lycopolis where Aquila and Priscilla was pulled to the side and they taught him a little more accurately. I was pulled to the side and I've got a little more accurate message to share with you this week. Beginning next month, we will start all of our Bible classes back at 9.30. Our worship services will be at 10.30. On Sunday evening services, we will be meeting each second and fourth Sunday night at 5 o'clock. Our first and third Sunday nights will be what we will consider open. And we're developing a three-month plan that... We hope to have to where you can see we're working on it right now to show how that's impacted and what we're, we're trying to do in the future. And so there's more to come. There's more activities. We're trying to meet our goals of what we presented to you some time back. And we're, we're trying to do things a little different. And we're, we're going to try this for at least three months. And, and if it works, good. And if it don't, we know how to punt and, and start all over. On every field Sunday will be church eat church, and we want them to be big events. We're going to come together and eat together, and uh, we want everybody to be planning on being at those. We want you here every Sunday. We really want you there then and bringing people with you, and it's one of our, our ways of reaching out to the neighborhood and inviting people to come and be a part of that. I think that's the most 
of what I've got to tell you this morning. And again, I'm sorry if I misspoke or if I confused somebody. If you've got questions, we've made uh, Chris James the person to contact with all your complaints. Please see, I'm kidding, come see, talk to us anytime. If you want, got ideas, we want them. You got thoughts of improvement, we want them. We'll take them. We may not use them, but we'll hear you. But we'll at least listen. Thank you. This last part will take just a few minutes, less than five minutes. Let's invite our lads to leaders to come on up at this time. Lads to leaders, come on up and leaderettes. While they're coming, let me remind you that Alyssa Bartholomew is graduating from high school. And there's a table. Turn me up just a little bit, please. There's a table of honor out there in the foyer for Alyssa for you to drop off cards and gifts and whatever you would like for Alyssa who's graduated from high school. All right. Before we dismiss, we want to show the congregation some of the successes and accomplishments of our Lads to Leaders the last season. We had 18 Lads to Leaders and Leaderettes, and that's the most that we have ever had. These young people participated in anywhere from six to 11 events of peace. Raise your hand when I call your name. Aubrey, Mariah, and Clay, they participated in nine events. Eli, raise your hand. Eli participated in 10 events. And Natalie and Bailey, raise your hand. Put your hand down, Eli. Natalie and Bailey participated in 11 events each. All right. Everybody that worked on scrapbook, raise your hand. Keep them up. Scrapbook hands, Aubrey, Leah, Natalie, Eli, Gabby, Mariah, Clay, Rhett, Bailey, Blake, Seth, Sadie, Sophie, Caden, Jaden, and Paxton uh, all worked on scrapbook. Now, Missy, hold that scrapbook up for just a minute. And we're going we're gonna to leave it on the table here for everybody to look at. We'll leave it up here for a few weeks for everybody to look at. That's a blue ribbon scrapbook. It won first place in Nashville. So congratulations on that, young people. By the way, our young people were competing against about a thousand other young people uh, in Nashville. All right. Do you remember our Pearl study when we were studying through the book of Hebrews together? That was Pearls. Most of our young people took a test on that information, and a number of our young people placed in the top 10 of Pearl scores for their age category. Listen to how many won top 10 in Pearls. Alyssa Bartholomew. Aubrey, Leah, and Natalie Buller, Bailey Carey, Sophie Gwynn, Caden and Jaden James, and Clay Manuel all scored in the top 10 for Pearl's Test. Now, we had four people on our Bible Bowl team. Raise your hand, Bible Bowlers. The three Bullers and Bailey were on the Bible Bowl team. Raise your hand, Bailey. All right. Now, you see how young uh, Natalie is? Raise your hand, Natalie. See how young she is? This whole team, including Natalie, had to compete on the high school level because Leah's in high school. And so they all had to compete against high schoolers. And they all they did was went up there and win first place, y'all. First place Bible Bowl team. Now, all four of these Bible Bowlers, including Alyssa, raise your hand, Alyssa, took the written Bible Bowl test now, Alyssa wasn't on the Bible Bowl team, but she did take the written test. And all five of these students placed in the top 10 on their Bible Bowl test. Aubrey, raise your hand. Aubrey got third place in song leading. We had three young people participate in art. Two of them uh, did drawings or paintings. And uh, Leah, raise your hand, Leah. Leah got third place for painting. Bailey got second place for painting. And one of our young people did photography in the art section, and Natalie got second place for photography. Bailey, raise your hand. Bailey Carey's speech won third place. And the rest of these young people, as you can see, their certificates, ribbons, medals, and all of this, they won for different things or were recognized for different things, like knowing the books of the Bible, Good Samaritan Projects, Keepers was lady, young ladies doing cooking and sewing and cleaning and babysitting. They all participated in, uh, most of them participated in year-round bulletin boards throughout the building. Scripture reading and Bible reading, a very successful last leaderette season. And we want to congratulate our young people. Thank you for the good job you did. We're proud of you. 
All right, you may return to your seat now. We do invite all of our families with young people to stay for lunch. We have a delicious lunch prepared. I've been smelling it the whole worship service, y'all. And, and so if you've got young people in your household, come to this meal and learn more about Last of the Leaders and Leaderettes as we will soon be kicking off a brand new season of Lads to Leaders, and we want your young people to be a part of it as well. All right, PJ. There's a call come ringing o'er the restless waves and the lights in the light. There's a soul to rescue, there are souls to save. Send the light, send the light, send the light. The blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. Please bow with me. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. And Lord, we're so thankful for all the things that you give us and do for us. And Lord, we're especially thankful for what we just saw on this stage. So many young people, so much talent, so much hard work. And Lord, to to see them and and be encouraged by them and the things that they've done over the last many months and and to, to receive the recognition. Lord, we're just so proud of them and so thankful that you put them in our lives and they're an example to us. And Lord, we we realize that there are many people that are here today and and not here today, Lord, but they're in need of your healing hand, whether that's physically, spiritually, emotionally, mentally, Lord. You know those needs, and we pray that you'll grant them the, the measure that they need. And Lord, there are also so many of us that we need to feel your presence in our lives daily, Lord, and we just want to keep you at the forefront of our minds as, as we go through this, this world. And Lord, as was mentioned earlier, we don't have to look far to realize that we're not living in heaven. There are many trials, many tribulations, and Lord, we see things that, that upset us and discourage us, Lord, but we know that 2,000 years ago, the battle was won, and Lord, we realize that we're working for a... Uh, we're working to be with you in heaven where things will be perfect. And Lord, even though we, we see the trials and tribulations that, that are a part of our daily lives, Lord, we realize that we're such a blessed people because we're yours. And Lord, we fall short in many ways, and we thank you for sending your son to die on that cross so that we will have a home with you in heaven forever. It's through his name we pray. Amen. <laughs> 